Like any artistic musical form, a convincing fugue ultimately grows out of its material. This is why no two Bach fugues are alike. Each one explores its own unique themes. This lesson gives a foretaste of the coming series of videos I will be doing next year, Analysis for Composers. Here our goal is no longer simply to recognize the constituent parts of a fugue, but to see how Bach makes a fugue into an architectural and expressive masterpiece. Here are the subject and counter-subject of the Bach fugue, BWV 547 for organ. The subject is short and it modulates. In the course of this fugue, Bach will explore many different modulations in spite of the harmonic mobility of the subject. At times, even the modulation within the subject itself will be modified to allow the harmony to wander more widely. The subject has a simple, easily recognizable contour. This makes it suitable for inversion, and indeed, later in the fugue, Bach will focus on the inverter subject. Look at the top voice in measure 27. A stretto table would show that this subject lends itself to various stretti, some of which Bach will use to create a sense of intensification later in the fugue. Here's one example. The lower voice in the right hand presents the inverted subject starting on the third beat of measure 34. The top voice arrives in stretto with the original form of the subject in the next bar. In any musical form, important events need to be highlighted and prepared. In a fugue, the entries of the subject are significant moments requiring this kind of underlining. Although a fugue has no major formal contrast, it does need to develop and breathe to avoid monotony. As we mentioned in the last lesson, the developmental aspect of this fugue, out of most others, takes the form of a series of gradually intensifying waves in the harmony and the counterpoint. The resitting moments in the waves allow the fugue to breathe. They arrive during several cadences, as well as in the episodes. Eventually, the whole fugue culminates in a powerful climax to be resolved at the end. Let's see how these things work in detail. First, how does Bach highlight the entries of the subject? Often, an entry will occur after a rest in the voice in question, adding something new in the texture. I mentioned in the last lesson that often, entries coincide with a suspension in another voice. This is an excellent way to keep the listener focused on a particular moment. Here are two examples. Having the entry on the tonic in measure 3 occur in a new voice, while the top part is holding a suspension, creates a buildup of tension. In this example, although the top voice is not silent before the entry, the suspension in the alto ensures that the entry takes place in a more intense way. The rising line of the top part of the previous bar also creates increased momentum toward the entry. These are ways to ensure that discussion around the fugue's material remains coherent and interesting. Remember, in good counterpoint, all the voices need to be interesting, but not at the same time. Focus is critical. We're aiming at an intense discussion, not at everyone yelling at once. Now let's see how the larger formal waves in this fugue are structured. The two main elements we will focus on here are the harmony and the texture.
Within the exposition, measure 6 and measure 7 and the first half of measure 8 make up a codetta. This codetta reaches a fairly strong cadence in C major in measure 8. What prevents this cadence from sounding overly final is the alto voice, which begins a new entry of the subject simultaneously with the C major chord. The top voice also keeps moving. This provides what I call a yes but punctuation. It allows the music to breathe, but not to lose all momentum. The second section in this fugue starts with two entries of the subject descending in register. The third entry, starting in measure 10, begins in G minor and modulates to D minor. The ensuing episode modulates back to G major, and then a final entry in the bass leads back to C major with another cadence in measure 15. As in measure 8, the punctuation is weakened by an overlapping entry, this time in the top voice. The alto voice also keeps moving in eighth notes. The next section is again made up of a series of descending entries. First we have only the higher register, providing a refreshing contrast from the full texture just before. The entries reach the lowest voice in measure 19. Note the slightly ornamented entry that starts on the last beat of measure 16 in the lower part. Entries in the top two parts, in measure 20 and 22, touch on E minor and A minor. The ensuing episode, from measure 22 to 25, recalls the episode in measure 6 to 8. The top part in the earlier episode becomes the bottom part here. An entry in the tenor part, in measure 25, touches on F major and modulates to C major. Notice that the first note of the subject here is syncopated. That makes it stand out more. Changing the rhythmic value of the first note is not unusual. Usually it's done to make the overall line flow better, or like here, to draw attention to an entry. A couple of beats later, we have another cadence, this time in G major. This cadence is not only overlapped with an entry in the top part, but once again weakened by a suspension in the alto part. The new section renews interest by exploring the inverted form of the subject in three successive entries, each in a different key. The following episode, from measure 31 to 34, is a chromatic modulating sequence ending on a half cadence in A minor in measure 34. This episode is imitative and texturally rather dense. This modulatory activity and the textural intensity of the episode combine to raise the overall level of intensity. The new section, starting in the alto voice in measure 35, once again overlaps with the cadence. For the first time, the subject is heard here in stretto, now between the inverted and original forms of the subject. Entries continue in pairs like this into measure 38. The inverted entry in the top voice of measure 38 leads directly to another, higher, in the same voice. Modulation is now fairly continuous, becoming even more intense with entries in F minor, measure 42, 43, and then in C minor, measure 44, 45. The texture is now constantly in four parts. It seems about to arrive at a half cadence in measure 47, but this ends up being a pedal point on the dominant of C minor. And now comes the most dramatic moment so far. Over the pedal point, the texture breaks up into cascades of appoggiaturas before landing on G major, now treated as the dominant of C major. The reason for this change of texture becomes clear in measure 49. It serves to announce the arrival of the pedals, playing the subject in augmentation. This pedal entry is itself a very powerful moment. In terms of orchestration, it's like adding the double bass or the tuba to an ensemble that, up until now, had no deep lower register. This effect is of course not specific to fugue, but Bach's fugues are powerful examples of musical architecture, and moments like this are very memorable. The episode that starts in measure 53 once again recalls that from measure 6 and 7, but with richer inner parts, since lightening up at this point would weaken the overall momentum now clearly in its final phases. Once the pedal sequence in eighth notes finishes, the bass continues to descend, and the harmony becomes astonishingly chromatic at times, for example on the second beat of measure 57, and then with a remote modulation at the start of measure 58. Once the bass arrives on the dominant in measure 59, it presents the inverted subject twice in a descending sequence. The harmony continuously oscillates between C major and C minor. Notice also the way the pedal line peaks on the leading tone in measure 61. This would be a mistake in most other situations, but here Bach wants to continue building up to maximum intensity, preparing for the coming climax. Finally, in measure 64 and 65, the music comes to a complete stop, pausing dramatically no less than four times on diminished seventh chords. After the continuous sixteenth note rhythmic movement up to this point, the effect is almost apocalyptic. 
Then, in an exuberant acceleration of the harmonic rhythm, the final cadence arrives in C major in measure 66. Since ending at this point would be too abrupt after the accumulated tension of the entire fugue, Bach adds a wave-like post-cadential extension over a tonic pedal, touching several times on 5 of 4 before ending with the final entry of the subject in the left hand of measure 71. Once again, the head of the subject is varied. This fugue, like so many by Bach, is notable for its sheer intensity and its dramatic momentum. We could look at five other great fugues by Bach, and although all of them would show this same wave-like structure, the details would be different, always growing out of the nature of the thematic material. This last point is central to understanding any great composer's music. Beethoven and Mozart wrote many pieces in sonata form, but the details are always different, determined by the material. An insightful analysis must begin to explain how they emerge from the musical potential of the material, as well as why things happen when they happen. As we mentioned in the last lesson, this is the opposite of the school fugue, where each fugue has the same modulations, the same form, and the same stretti in the same places. While the school fugue may be pedagogically useful at a certain stage, at some point it must give way to the real artistic problems of writing a fugue as a unique, convincing piece of music. There is one textbook called A Treatise on Fugue by the French pedagogue André Jodarge that, despite being centered on the school fugue, delves into the deeper musical issues. It is unique in containing a chapter called A Musical Construction of the Fugue, well worth reading. In our next lesson, we'll look at canons, and then the course will end with the discussion of counterpoint in other contexts and styles.